Let us pray. Our Father, we thank you for the opportunity we have to open the pages of the scriptures again because we know that every time we come there is something fresh, something new that you want to share with us. And we are praying that today you'll bless your children in Jesus' name. And I thank you for your people here, for the interest, for the love, eagerness you've given every one of us to study your word. I pray that whatever your purpose in every one of our lives, making us to come like this to study every time, that purpose will be fulfilled to the very limit in Jesus' name. Amen. We pray that at times of discouragement, times of financial problem, times of physical problem, you'll keep us on the right track so that all that we have been building up within us will not lose in Jesus' name. Amen. We are praying that today you will teach every one of us. You'll touch every one of us. And you will so influence us that our lives will make definite impact on the lives of other people. Thank you because we know you have answered. In Jesus' name we pray. We are looking at Acts of the Apostles chapter 17 from verse 1 to verse 15. As we have come week after week and month after month and we have slowly and diligently gone through the chapters we have studied on the Acts of the Apostles. It must have impressed you that the Holy Ghost has taken time to record for us things from the life of the Apostle Paul. At the time of the Apostle Paul, you must understand that believers in the church, in the church in which he ministered, or churches that he ministered, and believers that were won to the Lord through his campaigns or crusades or open air or evangelistic outreaches. And the various people that lived at that time, they didn't know there was so much they could learn from the life of Paul the Apostle. In fact, we will say that there might be some people that were so closely related, associated with Paul the Apostle moving with him, going along with him. People that really loved the Lord and they had the privilege of associating in a very intimate way with, with Paul the Apostle. Perhaps they didn't know there was so much to learn from the life of Paul the Apostle. But the Holy Ghost who knew the contribution, the divine contribution, the divine impute into the life and ministry of Paul the Apostle he knew there was so much for us to learn from him. And he has recorded in so many chapters of the Acts of the Apostles. Events after events, activities after activities. And uh, as the Holy Ghost is talking about the church, the Holy Ghost is also talking about Paul the Apostle. Because actually you, you cannot divorce the history of the early church from the history and the life and the ministry of Paul the Apostle. Many people in those days must have missed a lot of deep, deep things in the life and the ministry of Paul the Apostle that they should have learned. But the Holy Ghost has preserved many of those things for us. What a lesson we have from that, that in our own day too, there might be ministers of God and leaders in the gospel, your own area leaders, your own zonal leaders, the coordinator, the Head usher, a, a lot of uh, our workers here in various sections of the work, tip ministry, the Zoe, and uh, other areas of our work. You might see that there are people that the Lord is really dealing with in their lives. And yet, we move with them. You never really ask yourself a question Is God actually teaching me something through the life of this individual, this Christian worker? Because you never can tell. Just like the people in those days could never tell how much they could learn from Paul the Apostle. And he just moved with him, lived with him, went around with him, and they didn't really get much. Now for some people at the time of Paul the Apostle, he was a controversial figure. 
They discussed him. They argued about him. Some of them even slandered him. Some of them even neglected him and they felt there was nothing to it. And yet you'll be surprised that this person that appeared to be a controversial figure in the early church, to even believers, to even Christians, the Holy Ghost saw no controversy in his personality. And the Holy Ghost, page upon page, line upon line, chapter after chapter, has recorded for us deep, deep things we need to learn from the life of the Apostle Paul. And I'm praying that whatever the Lord has for you or has for me, none of us will miss in Jesus' name. Amen. You know, it's very easy for us to say that we're keeping too long in the Acts of the Apostles and that we should just, uh, you know, hurry up and finish up in time and then we go to another book. But if we go to another book, you'll find the same thing. Because if you go to the Old Testament, which we're likely to do after we finish that for the apostles, or after the Lord has led us to maybe take a break and, you know, go some other direction. If you go to the Old Testament, the same thing you'll find. That the Holy Ghost has selected some few people that laid their lives with such a great impact that there is so much for us to learn about them. And one by one, as we pick them up, you'll find that people in their own generation, the thought of some of these people as controversial personalities. But the Holy Ghost saw no controversy in their personality or ministry and has recorded for us much, much to learn. Come back home. In the days in which we live, there are ministers of God that will be judged controversial. Before our days, John Wesley, much more to learn from that man of God, John Wesley. If you've never read about his history as a Bible student and as a person who wants to be useful to God in a great capacity, because I know you want to, that's why you're here every Monday. You want to get that thing that is extra which will make you to have some spiritual dynamics in your life. That's why you are coming. And if you really want to see the fulfillment of your ministry, you should never live your life without some deep study of the life and ministry of John Wesley. People like Charles G. Finney, people like D.L. Moody, people uh, that made an impact in their generation just very recently. But, you know, in their own time, there were people that thought they were controversial. And yet now, after they have served their generation and they have gone, we can see that there is a lot to learn from them. But then, do you know that in our own um, state here, in our own situation here, we have a lot of leaders, state representatives, we call them, of deeper life. Have you ever noticed that when somebody is so very close to you, like a state representative, like some of our zonal leaders here, because they're very, very close, you just think their life is ordinary. And you don't think there's so much to learn from them. But you know, these people, you can learn a lot from their lives, a lot from their ministries, a lot from what the Lord is doing through them, because they are writing history. Each of those people, they're writing maybe a chapter, maybe just a verse, who knows? maybe more than a chapter of the history of the church in our age and uh, instead of just passing them by not even learning from one another even from those of us who are sitting down here today members of the choir people who are ushers other christian workers in our own uh, generation in our own church that you know you never really stop to look at the life of that individual because the Lord might be preserving something for you in the life of that individual that you are just missing out. Now, come back to Paul the Apostle. The people in his own generation, many of them, they thought he was controversial. They didn't see much to learn. I doubt very much. If those believers that came to Jerusalem, that argued about circumcision, that contended against Paul the Apostle, I doubt very much if they had anything to learn from Paul the Apostle. I doubt very much if some of those people in the church of Corinth, who were saying, I'm for Paul, I'm for Apollos, I'm for Severus, I'm for Christ, I doubt very much whether three quarters of them, three out of four, because you know three for Apollos, one for Apollos, one for Christ, and one for Severus, 
than one quarter for Paul. I doubt if three quarters of them really had anything to learn from Paul the Apostle. They missed a lot. And um, for Paul the Apostle, I I'm so surprised that we've been reading about him now from Acts chapter 9. Then you come into Acts chapter 11. Then you come into Acts chapter 13. When they had that powerful meeting in the church at Antioch and the Holy Ghost spoke and said, Separate unto me Barnabas and Saul for the work I have for them. And then you come into Acts chapter 14, chapter 15, chapter 16. Now we're in chapter 17. You know what? Not one verse until now are we told of his physical stature, of his facial appearance, of his mode of dressing, of his style of air court, of his type of sandals or shoes. You know what you learn from that? That the Holy Ghost has so much to say on the spiritual stature of the man, the spiritual growth of the man, the spiritual impact and development of the man, the spiritual authority and power of that man that the Holy Ghost just completely forgets about his physical appearance. How many times whenever we look at one another, whenever we see one another, how many times whenever we even want to learn from one another, we concentrate past 50% of the time on the physical. Maybe for some that are really on the, other, on the physical side, they concentrate 70% of the time on the physical personality, on the social status of the man. But the Lord has been taking us chapter after chapter, and not yet have we seen the physical, the social, but just, just the spiritual. And you need to train yourself, because it doesn't come naturally. To train yourself that when you look at a zona leader, an area leader, a Christian worker, you look at a child of God, you look at a man of God, you want to see what's the spiritual thing that is reserved for me to learn. Not the physical, not the things that you could see with natural naked eyes, but the spiritual that will really contribute something into your life. And we thank the Lord because he's giving us all these things and we can learn a lot from all these things. And uh, Paul the Apostle was a real great figure in the early church. Many people did not think so at that time, but the Holy Ghost has made us to know it so. Now in Acts chapter 17, let's um, see from verse 1 to verse 15. Now I want to remind you, so as to link you up with where we stopped last. Paul and Silas had just been out of jail, out of prison. Do you know what that means? If you have ever gone to prison before, whether you are a criminal or not, whether you did something wrong or not, whether you are suffering for the gospel ministry or not, if you have ever gone to the prison before, whether somebody told a lie against you or not, you know the first thing you do when you meet a Christian outside, the first thing you do is that you want to justify yourself. You want to say, oh brother, you might have heard I was in prison before, but you know that I was just part of persecution. You know there is something within each of us. And it varies from person to person. That always wants to clean up ourselves before people. We always want to say, well, you might have heard a story about me that I was in jail in Philippi, but you know, they told a lie against me. And really, I was working for God. Paul had no time for self-defense. Paul had no time for trying to convince you because Paul had only 24 hours in the day. In the morning, he woke up, he was thinking about reaching out again, wanting to evangelize. During the day, he was busy preaching the gospel. In the evening, he was pre busy preaching the gospel. After the meeting, he was counseling. And in the night, he was having a dream of night vision. When he was not preaching, maybe he was praying. When he was not praying, maybe he was receiving revelation from God. Whenever he was even asleep, his mind was awake, his heart was awake, linking up to the Almighty God. Whenever his body was resting, his spirit was in heaven. 
You know, a man like that has no time for self-defense. And this is a man, great, great man of God, Paul the Apostle, and Silas, the supporter, the one that walked along with him. They just be released out of jail. And immediately, without wasting any time, without sitting back to regret, without sitting back to spend some moment in self-pity, they just went to another city. What were they doing again? Preaching the gospel. They were so committed to this ministry of soul winning, witnessing, evangelism, that they did not allow persecutions or difficulties to stop their forward march. In a few weeks in Europe, that's in the place they were, it was part of Europe, the people of that place said, these are the men that have turned the world upside down. They had such a great impact wherever they preached the gospel. And from that, for that generation, God had Paul and Silas and other people. For our generation today, the year in which we live, the time in which we live, God does not have Paul. Paul has gone. Peter has gone. God has you. And I'm sure God can use you. And you need to think it over and over and over again. That all these people were reading about. That all the things that were given about them, they are just the spiritual qualifications. Which you can have, which I can have. Their physical status or height or stage or stature wasn't the consideration. Their educational attainment wasn't the situation. Look at when they were choosing all these people. Matthias from Acts chapter 1. And then when Philip went out in Acts chapter 8, and then when um, Barnabas was linked up with Paul, and then when there was, uh, you know, a little break between Paul and Barnabas, and then they brought in Silas, have you ever thought that in the consideration of the church, they were not considering the physical, but the spiritual? So you, you shouldn't think you are disqualified because of your physical stature, or because of your educational limitation. All that God wants to look at, to make use of you, is what he looked at in the lives of these other people. And is a spiritual side. And since that spiritual side is by grace and faith, whatever grace and faith have done in the lives of other people, the same grace, the same faith can do in your life in Jesus' name. And so, stop looking at the physical side of your own life, of your own... Um, of your own stature and begin to look at the fact that the grace of God abundant grace much grace still available and that grace can do something in your life to make an impact in your community today in Jesus name and so these people were chosen and we today we are chosen by God we are the instruments in the hands of God and we can do much we can do much if we can only yield unto him now in our passage we are going to look at four things. I do hope that you are studying on your own after we leave the Monday Bible study session. I do hope that you go back home and go over these things again and again and again and again. Because talking about courage, content, conversion and conflict, four things. Pick one of them, and you can spend hours, days, weeks, months on courage alone. And yet, in the Bible study here, we don't have that much time. And we have to deal with the courage in the passage, with the content of the message, with the conversion, with the conflict. That's why you need to go through on your own again, so that you really get the best that the Lord is preparing you for and preparing for you. But then in the passage, we'll see the courage of spirit that Paul the Apostle had, that Silas had, that the team members of Paul, that they had, courage of spirit. And then the content of scripture, if you follow Paul around, you will know that every time he opened his mouth, scriptures were coming out, logically arranged sequentially arranged 
and also in such a spiritual um, impact or a spiritual composition that whenever he gave it to the people it either ran them mad or ran them soft that means it either made them angry or made them converted because that man knew so much scripture in fact if you go through the epistles that he wrote you'll see how much he appealed to the old testament because of the knowledge of scriptures that he had and so in his preaching you'll see the content of scripture and then it always yielded fruit and the fruit will either be number one conversion or number two conflict nobody ever came into the meeting where paul the apostle was and remained the same it's either on the one side they'll be converted on the, or on the other side they'll get so angry and they'll want to actively aggressively oppose and persecute and do something about it everyone that had the message of paul the apostle did something about it he either embraced it or deliberately openly aggressively rejected it and so we have courage of spirit content of scripture conversion of sinners and conflict against the saints now the courage in acts chapter 17 verse 1 acts 17 verse 1 and now when they had passed through amphipolis and apollonia they came to thessalonica where was a synagogue of the jews and paul as his manner was went in unto them and three sabbath days reasoned with them out of the scriptures and in verse 10 and the brethren immediately sent away paul and silas by night unto berea who coming hither went into the synagogue of the jews why do we see courage out of those two verses we we'll see courage out of those two verses because in verse 1 we have the mention of a synagogue. He entered into that synagogue and he declared the truth of the word of God. In verse 10 we have another mention of the synagogue of the Jews. Now do you know from which people Paul had had the greatest difficulties? Or do you know from which people Paul had been exposed to the greatest dangers in his life? From the Jews in the synagogues. And yet everywhere he went, the very first place he will go to will be a synagogue. Why did he do that? Number one, he loved the Jews so much. He said, I would rather even give up heaven. I would rather be caught away, be accursed from the Lord, so that my kinsmen in the flesh, the Jews will be saved and come to the Lord. Because of his love, he always went to the synagogue. But not only that, he had faith in God. And he believed that even though these people have rejected the gospel, he knew that the Lord is facing the Gentiles, yet he knew that God loved them. And he had faith that they still could be saved. There was love, there was faith. Not only that, there was passion. Passion for soul. You know, that is the thing that makes a soul winner really go on witnessing and evangelizing. And it doesn't matter what you do against him. He loves you so much. He doesn't want you to perish. And if you beat him, if you persecute him, if you oppose him, if you do anything against him, he's going to come back again and he's going to say, ye must be born again. Passion for souls. And Paul just couldn't wait to allow all those people in the synagogues to remain in the darkness and superstition of religion. He always went to them because of passion for souls. One, love. Two, faith. Three, passion for souls. And then he believed in the supremacy of God. You know, he knew that no matter what the devil was planning, no matter what people are thinking of, no matter what the Jews wanted to do, the supremacy of God is there. And there's security in Christ. Confidence in God, faith in God. Knowing that God has patterned his life and what eventually God wants to do. When God wants to use him and the length of ministry, the length of time God wanted him to use or spend in the ministry, the Lord will fulfill it because of that. He always went there. But all those things that we talk about now, the love, the passion, the faith, 
the supremacy of God, the everything that Paul had led him to courage and boldness. You say, how can I have courage? Very simple. Have faith in God. Have a holy life. Those two things will result into courage in your life. Faith in God. Faith in God. Knowing that those enemies cannot be more powerful than God. Knowing that whatever those enemies or persecutors are planning or thinking, they will not be able to destroy the will of God in your life. Knowing that the promises of God are here and they meant for you. Knowing that whatsoever you desire, when you pray, you, you believe on the Lord, you believe that you receive, then you will have. Knowing that if God has committed himself unto you, he cannot change. He cannot go back because great is thy faithfulness, O God. When you have that type of faith, there will be courage in you. Then love. You see, w when you love people, you are not thinking of what evil they are planning. You are thinking of how you can help them. Bring them to Christ. If you have the love, the passion for souls, the faith in God, if you have all those qualities in your life, they will produce courage in you. But holiness is very important. You know, Paul the Apostle, he knew that even though they were throwing him to jail, even though they thought he was a controversial figure, even though they thought he was an injurious person, he knew that he had a free conscience, a good conscience towards God and towards men. That holiness, that spotlessness in his character, that flawlessness in his behavior, morals, in his life, made him to be bold. What are we told in scripture? In Proverbs chapter 28, verse 1. The wicked flee when no man pursueth, but the righteous are bold as a lion. If you are holy and you have faith in God at the same time, there will be courage within you. In Psalms chapter 27, Psalm 27, verse 14. Wait on the Lord, be of good courage, and uh, he shall strengthen thine heart. Wait, I say, on the Lord. If you move closely to God, you will lose the fears you have. Because there is no fear in God. Just like there is no darkness in God. There is no unbelief in the heart of God. The closer you get to God, the more faith you have, the more courage you have, the more boldness you have, the more you see the power of the Almighty God following you, supporting you, promised unto you, the more you will lose fear for men. And anywhere you go, you know that you are going with the Lord God Almighty and there will be courage within you. Remember? As an, as an evangelist, soul winner, or as a person who wants to witness to the glory of the Lord and bring people to the Lord, love for souls must be there. Passion for those who are perishing. Courage of faith in God. And then holiness of life. And all these things will provide or, pro or produce courage in your life. We all need courage. And then, of course, you must pray. In Acts of the Apostles, chapter 4. Acts of the Apostles, chapter 4. Verse 29. The people of God here were praying. And now, Lord, behold their threatenings. And grant unto thy servants that with all boldness or courage they may speak thy word. With all boldness or courage they will speak thy word. So, in our own lives, we should know that courage is very, very important. Courage in our spirits. Now, the content of scripture. Every time Paul the Apostle went out, he preached the gospel. He did not preach telling stories that will bring tears on your eyes. He was not preaching just as to affect your emotion. Of course, their emotions were affected. Their wills were, were affected. Their intellect uh, was affected. But primarily, he preached the scriptures. He gave the scriptures. 
And it wasn't about, you know, just telling stories or fables of women or just giving them proverbs or, you know, just using some methods to just bring them forward. Because evangelists today, they have the danger of being uh, too shallow in their presentation of the gospel. And then at the time of invitation, they call people forward. Some of the people that come forward, they do not understand why they are coming forward. Because they have not heard a sound message of salvation. But in the case of Paul the Apostle, and we're learning from him, the content of scripture was much. In Acts chapter 17, verses 2 and 3. And Paul, as his manner was, went in unto them, and three Sabbath days reasoned with them out of the scriptures, the scriptures of the Old Testament, opening and alleging that Christ must needs have suffered, and risen again from the dead, and that Jesus, that this Jesus, whom I preach unto you, is Christ. Now listen to me. We've been studying from Acts of the Apostles chapter 1. And we must learn something about the message of the soul winner. You ought to be a soul winner as a Christian. Jesus said, you shall receive power after that the Holy Ghost has come upon you. And ye shall be witnesses unto me, both in Jerusalem, in Judea, and Samaria, unto the uttermost part of the earth. Wherever you are, wherever you live, wherever you walk, you must be a soul winner. You must be witnessing to what Jesus Christ has done. But in witnessing or in evangelizing, the message is the same. The introduction may be different from place to place. The construction, the structure of your message may be different from place to place. The conclusion or the methodology of bringing the people forward to know the Lord may be different from place to place, from country to country, from continent to continent. There are or there are pa, in which you put the message. The outward form may look different but the content is always the same. I read about uh, Billy Graham. He's been um, an evangelist preaching the gospel. And uh, Billy Graham has made an impact in the ministry of the evangelist. Billy Graham does not do any other thing. Now, I'm telling you this. I'll show you the thing I wanted to mention, but... I told you that you must be learning from the people that God is using. For people, for some people. A person like Billy Graham, to them might be a controversial personality. Because of this, because of that. But remember what I've already told you. People in your own generation will look like a controversial personality to you. But don't make the same mistake that people in the days of Paul the Apostle made. And you never learn anything from these men of God that God is using. You learn whatever God wants you to learn. Rather than, you know, becoming argumentative or controversial. Now, reading about his uh, ministry of evangelism, there was a particular minister, an Anglican priest, that attended this crusade every night for three months. Because in that place, Billy Graham was preaching for 12 weeks every day. The same spot, the same place, just night after night, night after night. And this Anglican minister, he attended that crusade every night for 12 weeks, that means for three months. And after the whole thing, he went to Billy Graham and he said, I have been here every night of these three months and I've listened to you but I'm surprised that every night you preached exactly the same message every night now not that he picked up the same verse of the Bible not that he started in the same way not that the format was the same not that the structure was probably the same but there were some points that Billy Graham had to emphasize every night. And that is, 
about Jesus Christ, the blood of Jesus Christ that cleanses us from all sin, the cross on which Jesus Christ died, which has made the way into heaven, into the Father's presence, open unto us, the fact of repentance, turning away from sin, and embracing or believing the Lord Jesus Christ, and then the fact of having to make a decision right now, not delaying until tomorrow, but coming forward right now and receiving the Lord as your personal Savior. About Jesus Christ, His death, His blood, His cross, His resurrection for our justification, and then your part, repentance and faith in the Lord. Every night, every night, He mentioned those parts. And this Anglican priest said, you preach just the same message every night. Yes. At the restaurant, you cook the same food every time. For the people that are hungry. The people that ate yesterday might not be the people that are there today. You see, an evangelist is always talking to sinners. It's different from a pastor who is ministering to the believers all the time. An evangelist is a person that is talking to today. He may have a new audience, but an audience of sinners. Yesterday, he had a different audience, but an audience of sinners. And next week, wherever he goes, he's going to have a different audience, but an audience of sinners. Because the evangelist is always talking to sinners, and there is only one way to get into the kingdom of God, to be born again. Because of that, he has basically the same message. Now he may use different illustrations. He may start in a different way. He may try to put the structure on it. He may refine it a bit. He may pick his passage from the Old Testament or from the New Testament. He may start with a story or an illustration and then bring them back to the scriptures. Always is the same message. Ye must be born again. And at the end of it, he wants them to make a decision. Come to the Lord. Now, Paul the Apostle, he had the same strategy because it's always the same. In, a, in a First Corinthians chapter 15, First Corinthians chapter 15, from verse 1, Moreover, brethren, I declare unto you the gospel which I preached unto you, which also ye received, and wherein ye stand, by which also ye are saved, if ye keep in memory what I preached unto you, unless ye have believed in vain. Verses 3 and 4. For I delivered unto you first of all, that which I also received, how that Christ died for our sins, according to the scriptures, and that he was buried, and that he rose again on the third day, according to the scriptures. You see, that's always in the message. And if you have been following us in the study of the Acts of the Apostles, in Acts chapter 2, when Peter was given the message, you know what he touched upon? He touched on the personality and the ministry of Jesus Christ and then his death immediately. His burial and resurrection. And then the necessity of repentance and faith. If you throw your mind back and try to remember what we studied in Acts chapter 3, when Peter was preaching to a different audience, the thing that happened before, he, before the audience came together was the healing of that lame man at the beautiful gate, a different setting, but the same message, the death of Jesus, the burial, the resurrection, and the need for repentance and faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. And if you remember as, as Philip, was preaching in Acts chapter 8 to that Ethiopian eunuch, different setting, a different approach, starting in a different way. But in that message again, you will see the death of Jesus, the burial, the resurrection, repentance, faith in the Lord. Believing that Jesus Christ is the very Son of God. Changing your mind about whatever you believe before. Turning around. And, and if you go from passage to passage, and look at the time that the apostles or the preachers and acts of the apostles that they preach the gospel message of salvation the death of Jesus his resurrection and uh, faith in the Lord repentance all those things they, they come in not just morals not just becoming better turning over a new leaf 
joining a church and you must be very careful in the presentation of the gospel message if you want people to be saved when they listen to you and you're preaching as a soul winner as an evangelist or as a person witnessing the fact that Jesus died for our sins must be major in what you are saying the fact that he was buried and he died uh, he died he was buried he rose from the dead and now you are people are to repent and believe on the Lord Jesus Christ must always be a constant thing now in Acts chapter 17 after he preached what was the response Acts chapter 17 some of them, and some of them believed and consorted with Paul and Silas and of the devout Greeks a great multitude and of the chief women not a few and in verse 11 these were more noble than those in Thessalonica in that they received the word of the word with all readiness of mind and searched the scriptures daily whether those things were so therefore many of them believed also of honorable men honorable women which were Greeks and of men not a few now Paul the Apostle presented the gospel the fullness of the gospel and he presented it very very clearly and it made an impact on the people that they turned around they repented they changed they believed on the Lord Jesus Christ and they became saved and we're told that in in verse 4 a great multitude a great multitude and in verse 12 we are told that of honorable women and of honorable men not a few not a few he presented the gospel in such a powerful way that he had an impact upon them now don't get discouraged if you have not seen such results before in your own witnessing soul winning or evangelism i told you before that now is the time I'll be invited to preach in witness in a, a group and the people will want me to talk on evangelism to talk on Christ the Savior to evangelize and I'll pick up that topic and I will preach from the Bible but I didn't have the gift and the ministry of the evangelist I could teach the doctrine of salvation of justification I could I could explain repentance I could talk to me about the death of Jesus Christ I could talk to them about the grace of God I could talk to them about heaven I could talk to them about the necessity the urgency of getting saved but I never could talk to them about the simplicity of getting saved that was my difficulty and after telling them the urgency of salvation the necessity of salvation the importance of salvation and the change salvation will bring in their lives then I'll fail to be able to present it in a simple way and they didn't get saved and uh, I wonder well eventually I'll just uh, inside me I'll just say well they are not serious have you ever felt like that when actually the fault is not with them the fault is with you but thank God I'm learning more and more, not that I've finished learning, but I'm learning more and more on being able to present salvation, salvation messages to people in a very simple way, in a very direct way, in a very stimulating way, in an arresting manner that the people will want to make a decision to come to the Lord and get saved. And you can in your own life too. Don't get discouraged if you have not seen too much result. Don't get discouraged if you have not been able to present it very well before as um, a house fellowship leader. You, you have difficulty presenting the salvation message to the people in the house fellowship. Area leader or zona leader or you're a preacher and you have found difficulty in presenting the salvation message in such a simple direct way that the people are arrested and they are convicted and they want to repent. Keep on learning. Keep on preaching keep on praying by the grace of the Lord what the results other people have seen you will soon see it in Jesus name Amen. now the people they believed in verse 4 it says and some of them believed 
Greek authorities tell us, that is, those who have studied Greek and they are experts in that language, they tell us that they, what we live here is that they were persuaded. They were persuaded that Paul the Apostle, he presented the scripture so powerfully, so logically, that they just couldn't get out of it. They just yielded to the Lord and they became persuaded and they believed. The more you study the scriptures, the more you'll be able to persuade other people to believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. And the more you learn from other people that God is using in your zone, God is using in our church, God is using in the world today. The more you'll be able to present the gospel to you that will have impact on people. So there were conversions. And this is the thing that causes joy in the heart of the sinner himself who is saved, in the heart of the men who are instrumental to their being saved, and in the hearts of the angels of God in heaven. But then a conflict arose against the apostles, against these gospel preachers. In Acts chapter 17 from verse 5, But the Jews which believed not moved with envy, and uh, took unto them certain lewd fellows of the baser sort, and gathered a company, and set all the city on an uproar, and assaulted the house of Jason, and sought to bring them out to the people. And when they found them not, they drew Jason and certain brethren unto the rulers of the city, crying, These that have turned the world upside down are called hither also, whom Jason had, had received. And these all do contrary to the decrees of Caesar, saying there is, that there is another king, one Jesus. And they troubled, they troubled the people and the rulers of the city, when they heard these things, and when they are taking security of Jason and of the other, they let them go. In verse 13, But when the Jews of Thessalonica acknowledged that the word of God was preached of Paul at Berea, they came thither also and stirred up the people, and then immediately the brethren sent away Paul to go, as it were, to the sea. But Silas and Timotheus abode there still. And they that conducted Paul brought him unto Athens. And receiving a commandment unto Silas and Timotheus for to come to him, with all speed they departed. Now there was conflict. I told you everywhere the preaching of the gospel comes. You, you have people that are influenced or affected in one direction or the other. Some of them were affected in the right direction, they were converted. The others were affected in the wrong direction, they had conflict. Why did they have the conflict? Envy, jealousy, religious rivalry, religious bigotry. Moved all these Jews to cause an uproar against Paul and Silas and especially Paul because he was the chief speaker he was the one that was always uh, most of the time doing the preaching the speaking and these people were saying he's presenting another king another king Jesus is telling us that it is this uh, new king that will have control over your life that you must believe in that you must surrender to and you must yield the control of your life to this new king and you must walk by his authority by his word and by his law and they said but we have no other king except caesar and this man is diverting the attention of the people away from caesar onto another king that he called jesus he didn't want to believe and because of that they found this excuse but in the excuse they were, racing, they were racing opposition aggressively against the king of kings. And because of the conflict, Paul had to go to another town, Berea. And uh, he went with the team. When they got there, they started preaching again. And the Jews in the other town heard about it, and they came to Berea again to cause uh, confusion and to cause trouble. But what is significant is that 
Paul never gave up because of difficulties. He never gave up because of difficulties. But then as you look at Paul, you learn something in all these conflicts. He had the greatest conflict or the greatest difficulty, the greatest persecution than any of the other people. But surprisingly, he did much more than any of the other people. Surprisingly. At the greatest hindrances, the greatest difficulties, the greatest opposition, and yet he had the greatest productivity, more than all the other people. You know, in our own thinking, we think the church that has no problem will be the church that will have speedy growth and the church will do a lot and whenever we have little difficulty we give excuse oh we say you know it's because we're having such great difficulty that's why our church is not growing no paul the apostle had the greatest opposition persecution difficulty and yet he did much more than the rest not only that you know people say that um, i have so great difficulty so great opposition so great persecution that it hinders my prayer life it hinders uh, my being able to get into the power of the holy ghost because uh, whenever i want to pray all these difficulties will come and as i begin to think of these difficulties it has hampered or hindered my spiritual growth do you know the apostle that grew tallest spiritually highest spiritually and the deepest of all the deeper if there were deeper life uh, people at that time i hope there was and when we get to heaven we'll see them and uh, we'll say we're deeper oh is that so we too were deeper in the first century well never mind they might not call them that name but they were deeper than you know the people in Berea. they were deeper life people more than the people in Thessalonica. did you see that when i read it to you let's see it in verse 11 these were more noble than those in Thessalonica. The people in Thessalonica were Christians. They were believers. But these were deeper. These were people that were more noble than those in Thessalonica. In that they received the word of God with all readiness of mind. And they searched the scriptures daily. Whether those things were so. Therefore, many of them believed. Many of them, multitudes of them. They believe also of honorable women, which were Greeks and of honorable men, not a few. A large, large church in Berea. And now you see, all these people, they went deep into the word of God. But listen to me, the deepest of the deeper life were people at that time. They had great difficulties, great difficulties. You know, sometimes we say, well, I would have done so much for God, but I'm having so much great conflict in my place of work with my landlord with this person with this person because of the difficulties i'm having uh, because of that i'm not able to really do a lot in my life Paul had difficulties my brother my sister let the lord give you the very impact the very spirit of paul why shouldn't we be able to pray like that didn't you hear our preachers yesterday as they told us preparation for the double portion and that man, Elisha, he, he was so intent about it, and he was, uh, he was so diligent about it, that he said, what I need is a double portion. And if you are not going to have a double portion of the spirit of Paul, why not have the same thing that he got? And when you get the same thing that Paul got, you know what? Conflict will not be a problem to you. Opposition will not be a problem to you. Persecution will not be a problem to you. In all the persecution, in all the opposition, you'll be going deeper and deeper in Jesus' name. Uh, you know, they told us yesterday, and um, you couldn't hear any other thing greater than what they told us yesterday, that if you're really going to receive the double portion, you need in your life, you need to discover the divine purpose. I can tell you that Paul the Apostle was like this, never moved, never shaking, he never bent this way, he never bent this way, because he knew of the divine purpose in his life. And then they told us that there must be dutiful preparation. You know, without all that, because, you know, this uh, Apostle Paul, oh yes, he prepared himself. Like a student going to study. He prepared himself like a workman that needs not to be ashamed, diligently, pre dutifully preparing himself. 
And if you will not uh, do that, if you just, uh, you know, come to Monday Bible study, and if you just read the Bible casually, and pray casually, and whenever there is a little difficulty, a little conflict, you will not continue in a dutiful manner. You know, you will not be able to have it. And he told us that we must have diligent pursuit. And except you are pursuing after you say, Oh God, my heart is panting after you. My heart is panting after the price of the high calling. My heart is just longing. My heart is just desiring. And I'm going to have it. And I'm not going to allow anything to disturb me. You'll not be able to have it. But you can. But you can. The double portion or just uh, the measure of the Spirit of God, the powerful, impacting, effective Spirit of God that was in Elisha, that was in Paul as well. And then the double portion will come. But you know, if you just have this attitude and make up your mind that from tonight, I will be what God wants me to be. I will be what God wants me to be. I will be what God wants me to be. You will never be the same anymore in Jesus' name. Difficulties will not stop you. Opposition will not stop you. Uh, people slandering you, talking against you will never stop you. Lying against you will never stop you. Conflict will never stop you. The greater the conflict, the stronger you will become. The greater the conflict, the more powerful your ministry will be. And the greater the opposition, the more you'll be getting higher and taller and deeper in the things of the Lord in Jesus' name. The grace of the Lord is available for you. And I'm praying for you that as we are showing interest in the things of the Lord, coming on Sundays and Thursdays and Mondays as well, and seriously following after the teachings of the Word of God that you are receiving every Monday here, I am believing God. God has something for you. And I pray and believe wholeheartedly that thing God has in His heart concerning you, it will be done in Jesus' name. Who knows tomorrow? Because tomorrow... You might be like a Paul, standing in foreign lands and standing in uh, foreign tribes and standing in foreign communities, declaring that Jesus is Savior. Who knows, tomorrow you might be winning thousands, multitudes to the Lord. I pray that the purpose of God for you will be done. As a man, as a woman, diligently follow the Lord. Don't look back. Don't give up because of conflict or opposition. And what the Lord intended to do in your life, He will do speedily. Let's rise up and pray. I want you to present yourself to the Lord. The Lord is planning for you. Don't be afraid of conflict, difficulty, persecution. The greater the storm, the stronger you become. Don't let any of these things move you. Look up to the Lord. He has a divine purpose for your life. And he will fulfill it. He will. He will. He will.